کنفرانس قیام و مقاومت علیه رژیم اعدام سخنرانی آقای مایک پومپئو و خانم مریم رجوی چهاردهم مهر ماه 1402 
uh, NCRI has significantly improved inside the country over the past year. Despite the arrest of thousands of members of the resistance units, their network has expanded in many provinces. Regarding the last year's uprising, the speaker of the Mullah's so-called parliament said, the MEK had the most significant role in organizing and conducting these incidents. The regime's experts say the main question in our country, which we must deal with today, is the MEK. They say, and I quote, today uh, we are facing a new version of the MEK, which is certainly more dangerous. End of quote. they mean is that the MEK has developed a vast network inside Iran. For this reason, the regime has stepped up its attacks on the MEK to counter the advances of the resistance. Inside Iran, they do this by suppression. On the international level, they do it by demonization and by asking other governments to impose restrictions on the Iranian resistance. In this way, the regime tries to keep its balance. The core issue is the regime's fear of a nationwide movement that is ready for a fundamental change in Iran. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, Dear friends, it has been a long time that none of the advocates of appeasement can openly defend this criminal regime. No one can claim that there is a moderate faction in religious fascism. Instead, the advocates of appeasement rely on uh, three main arguments. First, they say if the regime is toppled, the situation will get worse. Second, they say that the regime is capable of containing the protests. Third, and the most important one is that they deny the existence of any credible alternative and say that the MEK does not enjoy any support in Iran. Recently, the U.S. government gave considerable financial aid to the regime. Your description, Mr. Secretary, uh, clarified the core of the matter. You said this was a massive financial support to the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Yes. For the mullahs, however, the biggest help is to deny the existence of a credible alternative and the decisive role of the MEK and NCRI in Iran, and limit their impact by denying their rights and creating obstacles. It was recently revealed that because of the policy of appeasement, the clerical regime had been able to install some of its agents in various United States government agencies. The uh, mastermind and contact point of this network is a member of the Revolutionary Guards. The duty of this network has been to pump the Iranian regime's desired uh, this information into the decision-making centers in the U.S. The common aspect among the members of this network is their hostility to the MEK that is reflected in dozens of articles and numerous tweets by them. In the 
past four decades, uh, every time uh, foreign governments have taken a stand against MEK, uh, the mullahs have been behind it. The bankrupt policy followed by those governments is against the Iranian people's uprising and against global peace and security. A viable policy that would advocate freedom in Iran and peace and security for the world has been expressed in House Resolutions 100 and 627. I'm sure that the policy that is uh, recommended by 124 former leaders and uh, 3,600 lawmakers from around the world will soon be proven correct. They have defended the Iranian people's uprising to overthrow the regime and establish a democratic republic. They have supported the democratic alternative and the Iranian resistance's plan for the future of Iran. <laughs> the Iranian people are uh, determined to overthrow the religious dictatorship. They reject all kinds of dictatorships both the Shah and the Mullahs. So I'm confident that Iran will be free. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that incredibly kind introduction. Uh, it is a privilege to be here. But I, I, I didn't want to miss this because, like you, when I, when I hear President Rajavi speak, I am inspired and I am heartened. You are so gracious, so lovely, so fierce in your determination. I am very confident that, as you said, one day Iran will be that very free, very democratic place that everyone in this room wants it to be. No, we are. When, I, when I heard you speak, it reminded me of uh, a man who I didn't know well, but who was a mentor of mine, President Reagan, who bluntly looked at a nation that was repressing its people. And he said, this is really easy. We win, they lose. We can do that in Iran as well. It, we're here to mark a special anniversary, and I, of course, want to acknowledge the bravery and sacrifice of so many Iranian, brave Iranians over the past year. The, the brutal regime has committed a great many atrocities to silence their voices. You know we continue to see them. For those who will get a chance to see this, whether they are in Evan prison or in a difficult place inside of Iran, know that we love you, we are with you, and we will never forget the responsibility we have to support what you are doing inside of that country. Thank you, and God bless you. You are an inspiration to all of us. You know, I, 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 I last spoke to you back in July, just three months ago, and yet much has happened since then. It's a short time, but yet one year after the beginning of the uprising, 
The regime is in a complete deadlock. It has no way out of the crisis, the conflict between the people and the government, which in fact in those 90 days has only intensified. The civil unrest has become more powerful. The regime responded with more executions, more, represent, more repression, more imprisonment, more torture, exactly what one would expect from a scared set of leaders. This has indeed deepened the divide between the regime and its people, just as we know it would. We should know that everyone in this room shares the same goals. They have shown that the IRGC, which keeps the regime in power by brutally suppressing protesters, has been shaken by the events of last year. And things are only going to get worse for it. I'm confident of that. I believe it with all my heart for the Iranian people and the resistance. Informed and encouraged by the folks in this room today is stronger than they are. We, we each, of, each of us, everyone around the world must recognize what these uprisings are aimed at. They are aimed at a democratic free republic of Iran that is devoid of any form of dictatorship. That's our objective. Everyone here shares that goal. And I want to make three points clear before I leave you all today. First, no matter what the regime does, it is doomed to fail. Second, second and even as important, change in Iran can only be achieved by those who have been working toward it for decades, those who have paid the price for it and contain the organizational structure to accomplish that objective. These things don't happen on their own. Finally, for the future, U.S. policy towards Iran has to be centered around support for this organized opposition and increasing pressure on the regime until it falls. Look, many of you no doubt saw President Raisi's recent remarks at the U.N. General Assembly. Uh, I was in New York that day. I was but a couple of blocks from there. You should know my wife was mad. She was mad because the appeasing United States government was protecting the butcher of Tehran while it was threatening the lives of me and my family. That is personal. But this isn't about me. It's not even about any of you. This is about a cause and a noble purpose that is far bigger than each of us. These remarks he made, if you saw them, were absurd. He made absurd claims in his remarks, such as insisting that the regime favored peace in Ukraine as it sells drones that murder innocent Ukrainian civilians. But you know, even he couldn't deny the effect the organized resistance inside of Iran has had on the regime's ability to continue its brutal dictatorship. Indeed, you all, the organized resistance led by the MEK, every day is increasing its capability. It is delivering an even bigger push your work has made it far more difficult for the IRGC to inflict its brutal terror and mayhem on the people of Iran. Their numbers continue to grow, and despite mass arrest, the Iranian regime knows it's on its back foot. You all, the MEK, and your supporters have organized rallies abroad, too. One such rally numbering in the thousands happened on September 19th. It took place just across the street from the United Nations, protesting Raisi's visit and in support of President Rajavi and her 10-point plan for the future of Iran. It was glorious to watch traffic stop in New York. You know, I must say that even the fact that Raisi was permitted to travel to New York City and allowed to speak at the General Assembly, the United Nations, for goodness sake, a body that is supposed to support basic, the most fundamental human rights for each of us, frankly, it shows how destructive the effects of appeasement towards a murderous regime can be. That appeasement has been and remains the biggest outside obstacle to ending Iran's state-sponsored terror, terror, its rogue regional behavior and its support for the Iranian people's desire to struggle for bringing about change in Iran, appeasement will not work. It was appalling that the Office of Special Envoy for Iran at the State Department, in the midst of the Iranian uprising, 
chose to focus his attacks on the MEK. Instead of supporting protesters, it's thought to please the Ayatollah, even using the same words that were used by the regime. Let me be clear. Attacks against those who seek freedom and democracy in Iran is absolutely deplorable, whether it comes from my government or anywhere else. No patriotic American, Republican or Democrat, should want this. And speaking of absurd, six billion dollars, six billion dollars of appeasement, more evidence that the Biden administration's recent decision to pay to get Americans home to their families, something that I worked so hard to do for so long. We got 58 Americans home during my time in the Trump administration, six billion dollars. Claims abound that this money can only be used for humanitarian purposes. You should laugh there. Let's be clear, we know this. There is zero chance this money is gonna benefit the Iranian people, none. You all know this, the regime just got $6 billion to spread terror to America, to Israel, and to destroy its, ally, destroy its enemies all across the world. And it'll use this money to go after Iranian dissidents, both outside of the country and inside of the country. $6 billion to fund its brutal oppression of the organized resistance inside of Iran. This is a page straight out of President Obama's playbook. This case was made again when President Obama, without Senate approval, committed the American people to the 2015 deal, which put Iran on the pathway to the, a nuclear weapon and a nuclear weapons program, one that they are on the cusp of achieving today. That money, that money did not benefit Iran's people or move it towards freedom and any internal change. Instead, it did what that money always does. It fueled the Ayatollah's capacity to harm the Iranian people. Now, it's probably not surprising because familiar faces from the Obama JV team have returned to the Biden administration. One of them, in, quite fortunately, is now on paid leave. Madam Rajavi spoke to this. We now know that operating inside the United States government were people working on behalf of the United States ostensibly, but who were taking guidance from Foreign Minister Zarif and his henchmen inside of Iran. You know, I remember when I became Secretary of State, we cut off funding for UNRWA precisely because of this risk. We knew where this money would go. We knew that the previous administration had been listening to the, the leadership in Iran, we didn't know that they were so deeply infiltrated inside our government. You know, we were able to sanction Iran, put real pressure on them, and we still brought home two hostages. Mr. Wang and Mr. White came home to their families without giving one single dime to this terrorist regime. This policy to which we have returned, not just America, but large European powers as well, totally counterproductive. Iran's newfound wealth, we'll see it in the months and years ahead. It'll fund terror abroad and oppress people at home. So let's wake up, let's get it right. All of us, not just the United States, but every one of us. Listen to the voices of the Iranian people. In over 280 cities across all 31 provinces of Iran, they have rejected the ruling theocracy and made clear that the mullahs are not a permanent feature of this nation. Chance, chance like you all have said here today, of down with the oppressor, be it the Shah or the Ayatollah, we do not need dictators. This should tell us everything we need to know about who we should be acting in support of. It could not be more morally clear. But sadly, If we continue to appease Iran, it will continue to exploit this weakness for its own gain, as it has in the past. 
and this won't stay inside of Iran. Indeed, that's already happening, and you all know this. Look at where I last was with you, Ashraf III in Albania. Look at the attacks against MEK members there. The basic security, the most fundamental rights of Ashraf III's residence should be incredibly important to every nation and to all peoples. Any of us who value freedom should understand that they should have their rights too. It was about a year ago that I had the privilege to get there. I met with the brave, noble men and women who have committed their lives to liberating their country at great risk to themselves and their families. Many among them were witnesses, survivors to the 1988 massacre perpetrated by the same man who spoke at the UN General Assembly last week, the butcher of Tehran, Mr. Raisi. So many of his victims belonged to the MEK. Indeed, they were his primary target. But because of their dedication, their joy, their commitment to freedom for all Iranians, they are the focus of the mullah's wrath, but they are seen in the eyes of our God as true heroes. I was, you know, you know, when you serve as America's Secretary of State, you, you have bad days, you see dark things. But I must say, I was appalled by the attack on Ashraf III on June 20th of this year. And it's to no one's surprise, it was highly and repeatedly celebrated by the regime in Iran and its top leaders. Indeed, they simply demanded more attack, more destruction of these freedom fighters. We should be clear. It was the Biden administration's policy of appeasement towards Iran that left Ashraf III residents vulnerable to this very attack and to further intimidation. When we show deference to the Ayatollah and his cronies, their victims, their victims lose our protection. Look, we can do more. I believe the United States should do everything. I believe. I believe that the United States, I believe the United States should do everything in its power to help the Albanian government withstand threats, intimidation, and blackmail by the Iranian regime. I know they're feeling pressure. I can see it. We can do better. A resolution filed in the House of Representatives after the attack on Ashraf III has already gained bipartisan support. That should encourage us all. Over 100 House members signed this petition. It calls on the United States government, in cooperation with our ally Albania, to ensure the full protection of the Iranian political refugees that live at Ashraf III. Pretty simple. This should be the guideline for United States policy, and this should be how we deal with the people, the heroes at Ashraf III, and deny the Iranian regime its wishes there. I want to close with joy and opportunity, because I believe it is real and it is deserving. As we seek to support the resistance movement inside Iran and out, we must consider what the future should hold for Iran, what it should look like, what is it we want. Everyone here wants freedom for the Iranian people. Let's talk about how we can achieve it, how we can build something that can not only replace the regime, but do so in a way that is lasting and secures freedom for everyone inside of that beautiful nation. As I've said before, Iran will never return to the dictatorship of the Shah, nor will it settle for the current theocracy in Iran. The remnants of the past monarchy have failed to gain any traction during the uprising over the past year. The Shah supporters were exposed when they heavily relied on collaboration with the IRGC. What, what Iran needs is something that looks and feels like the people in this room. People who simply want freedom for all. A governance model that is reflective of the people's will. We don't need, we don't need dictatorships. We need freedom. It's our moment. Um, this is the time. I'm confident. Our ask should be simple. We should ask every leader to support the brave Iranians 
who are inside of the country and who stand daily at great risk to themselves and their families against this theocracy. We've seen what happens in one year, a year of powerful, unyielding protests. These protests ride on the backs of those who have gone before them. 40 years of organized opposition to Iran. My country has a responsibility as well. We have historically been a nation that defends human rights broadly and everywhere. And while we don't always get it right, we know what is right. And in this case, the American people, regardless of who our leaders may be today, the American people won't know what is right for the, for the people of Iran. Freedom, democracy, the ability to raise their families in the way they want, and a failing regime in Iran no longer standing in the way of that. When I, when I look at the group assembled today, I know that some of you have loved ones who are inside the country. Some of you have loved ones who have been murdered by the regime. Some of you have friends or family who are in a prison today or under threat from the Iranian regime. My wife and I pray for each of you, as do, as do so many of my fellow congregants in the United States. Know that we think think about you often, and we pray for you. And we know that the work that you're doing is important and noble and decent, and in the finest tradition of humanity. Let us, let us not forget to win and make sure that the Ayatollah and his kleptocratic theocracy loses. Let us not forget about all those who have sacrificed so much to get us to where we are today. And let us not forget that our work continues to be noble and decent and right. And when we do, this righteous project to lead Iran back to a place where the people of Iran once again can continue to live their lives as they see fit, that this day will come upon us soon. I know it will be so. I'm inspired to be here. Thank you, President Robert, for letting me do this.